So we're here now for the, for the main crux of this afternoon. We're here for the forum, uh, the cryptocurrency, the truth, and the myth, so that we will hopefully come out after the, this afternoon knowing what is fact and what is fiction. No? And of course, with the recognition and the reality that it's here to stay, so how can you make money Are and all protected, so and is that enough for you to invest? Invest or invest more? No? So ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have with us the keynote speaker, the, the, the Honorable Nestor Espinilla, Governor of the Central Bank. Um, I, will, I, I hope to do justice. This is already a, a very abbreviated introduction, but he took office as the fourth governor on July 2017. Uh, what I am proud to say was that I had a bet with some of my friends, which was over a year ago, that he would be the governor, and he keeps on teasing me because he said I was going to lose my bet, but my, 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 my bet was on the governor. No? Maybe part of the reason is because we're both from UP, and we also went to the same high school, but he was a year ahead of me. So I was following his footsteps, literally. So he's also, uh, so he serves as a chairman of the Monetary Board. Uh, he's also concurrently the chairman of the Anti-Money Laundering Council and the Financial Stability Coordinating Council. You know? And as many of you know, pr previous to his appointment as governor, he was the deputy governor in, in charge of supervision and examination. He made sure that you know we in the banking system were doing the right things. And uh, he, in rather than be there as an opponent, he was there really guiding us and making sure that uh, you know there was growth in the economy. Uh, so he focused on reforms, capital market development, consumer protection, and financial inclusion. Uh, he likewise championed the issuance of regulations to promote inclusion and consumer protection. He is a staunch advocate of an efficient, interoperable, and consumer-friendly digital payment system, which is, I guess, where everything is moving towards. No? The governor holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Economics, magna cum laude. I was magna nakao because I had no, no uh, awards. And he has an MBA from the University of the Philippines. He's also a recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award in uh, UPBA because we, we highly regard the governor. Master of Science, a degree in Political Science from the Graduate Institute of Political Science in Tokyo. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all give a welcome to the Honorable Nestor Espinilla. Thank you, Ed, for the kind introduction. Officers and members of the Shareholders Association of the Philippines, guests from the public and private sectors, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to share the Banco Central's insights and initiatives on privately issued cryptocurrencies. I'm hopeful that in doing so, we will, as your team suggests, be able to cut to the truths and myths surrounding this fairly novel medium of exchange. I hope you notice that I make a very key distinction as there's such a thing as central bank issued digital currency. I'm not going there today as that's a different conversation entirely, even as the underlying technology may be similar. So today I'm gonna to talk about privately issued cryptocurrencies. But there it is. Cryptocurrencies are a medium of exchange. The BSP recognizes this. We have defined crypto or virtual currency as any form of digitally stored value created by an agreement within the community of virtual currency users. As far back as 2014, the BSP advised the public of the features benefits and attendant risks in dealing with cryptocurrency. We have adopted a regulatory approach to privately issued cryptocurrency that is balanced, open, and flexible. This is to allow the market to promote financial innovation and for the industry to take advantage of all its benefits and efficiencies with prudence. We have issued and we will be re ready to issue more, more responsive regulations. Last February 2017, we issued circular number 944. We now require businesses engaged in the exchange of privately issued cryptocurrency 
for equivalent fiat money to register with the BSP as remittance and transfer companies. Moreover, we strongly caution the public against unscrupulous individuals or groups who offer virtual currency pyramid schemes disguised as initial coin offerings or investment products. The advisory likewise provided tips on, secure, on securing virtual currency accounts. I think this trust is something that we share with Sharefield, considering your mission to respect consumer education and protecting investors' rights. To be clear, we do not endorse privately issued cryptocurrencies as a medium of exchange. Moreover, given their highly speculative and volatile nature, we do not endorse them as investment vehicles either. Rather, our objective as a central bank is to address any risks that they may pose to the public, even as they exist as a fact of life for this mode of payment to be used for illegal purposes. In keeping with our mandate to promote financial stability, we also aim to address any risks posed by cryptocurrency to the financial system. These risks are not imagined. They arise as cryptocurrency necessarily interplays with the non-digital world, the regular economy, when they are exchanged into pesos or other traditional currency. It is important to note that privately issued cryptocurrency is not legal tender. Unlike fiat money, such cryptocurrencies are not backed or guaranteed by any central monetary authority. Only the BSP has the sole power and authority to issue currency within the Philippines. Under the law, no other person or entity, public or private, may put into circulation notes, coins, or any other object or document which might uh, circulate as currency. Our notes and coins are fully guaranteed by the government and are legal tender in the Philippines for all public and private debts. While privately issued cryptocurrencies do not enjoy legal tender status, they are, however, as a matter of practice, used as a medium of exchange and a store of value. But there are so many other things. This brings to mind a story about a red paper clip that went viral. Some of you may actually be familiar with it. In 2005, a Canadian blogger, Kyle MacDonald, began a series of transactions which he posted online. He began with a red paper clip as a medium of exchange. He exchanged this for an interesting looking fish-shaped pen which he traded for an odd-looking doorknob, then a camp stove, and so on and so forth. By his 13th barter, in a little over a year, MacDonald was in possession of a movie role, or a chance to act in a movie, which was finally traded in for a two-story farmhouse in a small Canadian town. And it all started with a red paper clip. It's an interesting story. You can actually Google it. This red paper clip has uncomplicated elements that differ starkly from cryptocurrencies, high-tech world of blockchains, miners, and cryptography. I introduce it not just to keep your attention or to, re or to refresh you with its simplicity, but because there are powerful, and common lessons to be learned from it and from the phenomenon of cryptocurrencies. What are these? First, additional participants in a transaction exponentially increase value, which is defined, measured, and transferred through consent. Second, there is power in leveraging on digital technology as a connector of people. And finally, people always count. Using these points, allow me to share not only 
more insights on cryptocurrency, but also some initiatives in the BSP's exciting financial reform agenda. Initiatives which, unlike cryptocurrencies, we fully endorse. The first lesson from both the red paper clip story and the phenomenal use of privately issued sectors define and determine what they deem to be valuable. On the other hand, while privately issued cryptocurrencies are fast gaining global popularity, we deem their acceptance as still limited. We believe privately issued cryptocurrencies cannot completely fulfill the roles of money as a store of value and as an independent unit of account. Until such time that such cryptocurrencies are able to fully demonstrate stability, the prospect that they will replace today's fiat currencies appears to be far off. They are simply too volatile. The second lesson is that there is power in leveraging on digital technology as a connector of people. In the red paper clip story, it cannot be denied that the values that were traded were not just the objects themselves. In fact, they were especially in the beginning, only ordinary objects and might even be considered as junk by many. Rather, the psychic value came from the opportunity to be online personalities from viral exposure as all trades were posted on McDonald's blog that had earned quite a following. As with cryptocurrencies, the great social experiment could also not have been possible without a dynamic computer to computer connection. In this regard, the BSP acknowledges the huge potential of digital technology that include cryptocurrencies to transform financial service delivery, especially in the area of payments and remittance. High-speed digital networks allow funds to move across the globe at a much faster, cheaper, and convenient way compared to traditional models. Their use is game-changing for the unbanked, given their affordability and wider reach. As far as the BSP is concerned, this is worth looking into as it is consistent with our financial inclusion advocacy. For this reason, we continue to closely engage with various stakeholders, including fintech players, to better understand varying business models, processes, and systems. Our priority is to develop a digital financial ecosystem that supports the, the diverse needs of all users in a manner that is secure, sustainable, convenient, and affordable. For the service providers, whether new or incumbent, this ecosystem enables them to tap into a wider client base, diversify revenue sources, and secure new growth opportunities. And to us, this line of pursuing financial inclusion is more in keeping with our financial stability objective. The pillars of such an ecosystem that leverages on technology would include an efficient retail payment system that facilitates delivery, delivery of digital products, especially for small value transactors, an expansive network of low cost touch points to onboard new clients and facilitate the digitizing and disbursing of cash and other financial transactions, and democratize access to a transaction account wherein every person, regardless of economic and social stature, is able to open an account and use digital financial products. Overall, this inclusive digital finance ecosystem will support the diverse needs of all users in a safe, convenient, and affordable manner. It would have the right mix and range of service providers, banks and non-banks alike, and digital platforms to facilitate the sustainable delivery of fit for purpose and affordable financial services 
especially designed for the low-income market. The final lesson in all this is that people always count. This is what drives us in BSP as we pursue game-changing financial reforms to deepen financial markets, foster financial inclusion, increase consumer protection, and to basically improve the quality of life for all Filipinos. That being said, I must say that this new frontier of cryptocurrency brings us or brings up legitimate concerns that affect people, that affect the public. These issues are being looked into by the BSP and other financial regulators globally. One issue is private cryptocurrency as an investment option. Its value is volatile for starters. Thus, we earnestly caution the public that before speculating or investing their hard-earned hard money in cryptocurrencies, as with any other type of investment, prospective investors should first know and fully understand the risks involved. Because people matter, we at the BSP, like SharePill, value investor education. We have, together with other government agencies, including the SEC, made plans to embark on a nationwide public information campaign on cryptocurrency. The purpose is to inform and educate the public on what, crypto, on what cryptocurrencies are, their uses and risks, related policies and regulations in the Philippines, and possible benefits. Another serious concern is cryptocurrencies' attractiveness to and used by money launderers and terrorist financiers. This attractiveness stems from the anonymous and encrypted identities of transactors in private cryptocurrency. It is this very anonymity that cryptocurrencies users, uh, cryptocurrency users value the most. It enables them to transact in the so-called dark web. Allow us, at, uh, allow us at the BSP to offer a contrary idea. There is power in identification. We believe that to significantly catalyze a digital ecosystem, there must be a reliable national identification system. This system will address persistent con customer onboarding issues due to lack of acceptable IDs and, high, and other highly inefficient paper-based KYC processes which make servicing small value transactions attractive or unattractive. The BSP therefore strongly supports the passage of the Philippine ID System Bill, which was identified by the LEDAC in its August 2017 meeting as an urgent measure. The lower house, you may not know, has already approved its version on third reading. At the Senate, its version is tentatively scheduled for sponsorship today, March 12, even as we speak. Truly exciting. The envisioned national ID system will be designed to ensure universal coverage, data integrity and security, and optimum utility. It will serve as an enabling platform for the efficient delivery of a whole range of government and private sector services for all Filipinos, especially the currently unserved. Establishing a readily verifiable digital identity will enable our people to open accounts and use financial services more efficiently. All of these messages obviously comes from a central bank governor wary of currencies that do not qualify as legal tender and which are not backed by any monetary authority. But it is also a message that comes from a central bank governor who has been labeled as a disruptor, one that leads an institution that is ready to embrace the challenges of a rapidly changing financial and economic landscape. This message is shared with this audience, a staunch, a staunch advocate of investor rights and, and investors' need for information. I believe it is a good match. 
As I close, to align this message better with your theme, let me summarize the truths and myths of cryptocurrency from the BSP's viewpoint. Myth. Privately issued cryptocurrencies are legal tender and shall soon replace fiat currency. Truth. Cryptocurrencies, not backed by any central monetary authority, are not legal tender. Moreover, until they fully demonstrate stability, wide acceptability, and other economic attributes, they will not replace fiat currency anytime soon. Myth. Cryptocurrencies are bad and are only used for illicit activities. Truth. Cryptocurrencies, like fiat currencies, are neither good nor bad. They are neutral. But no doubt, BSP is mindful of their wide use in illicit activities because of the anonymity of its transactors and is taking action in this regard. Myth. The BSP endorses the use of and or investment in privately issued cryptocurrencies. True. The BSP allows the market to develop, but it has also issued responsive regulations to uphold consumer protection and to maintain financial stability. The BSP does not endorse or promote privately issued cryptocurrencies, but aims to address its risks as it intersects with the financial system. Rest assured that the BSP maintains a forward-looking approach to ensure that regulatory and supervisory frameworks are in tune with emerging trends and developments to constant surveillance and monitoring of the market, the BSP stands ready to adapt to future challenges and opportunities ahead. <clears throat> I hope I have delivered on the terms of reference for this forum. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you for your attention. Maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Governor, for your talk. Uh, very informative. I do want to have uh, or ask a specific question about the allocation of Bitcoins. I think the message here was uh, more about what Bitcoins can and cannot do. But from a disbursement perspective, what I'm seeing and reading is that there's only a finite number of Bitcoins, 21 million, I believe, which is allocated. My question is, from your perspective, who are the group of people or group of companies that actually are authorized to allocate these? And is this something similar to what the BSP's role is or a central bank's role? So maybe in that perspective, I'd like to further understand that because it's really that question of who controls sending this block of Bitcoins to this particular market is really what baffles, I think, a lot of people. I think once it's in the market, then you can actually trade it similar to like a stock item or an asset. But prior to that, it's something that I'd like to ask. Not sure if uh, this is something that um, <coughs> The value is what the transactors accept to be its value. And it's issued by a community outside the control of any uh, authority at this point of time. That's why, uh, you know, I make a fine distinction. There is a lot of discussion of these days of central banks actually phasing out fiat currency and issuing digital currency of its own. It's a very different animal altogether compared to what I assume to be our topic today, which is privately issued cryptocurrency, issued by a community outside the Philippines, but circulating or being used as a medium exchange by a subset of our population. Its value is what these people accept the value to be. Like a red paper clip, traded upwards until it became a two-story farmhouse. Take draw what lessons can you, you can from that uh, example. So, Governor, maybe you can expound further, right? You said earlier that I guess not unlike the Philippine currency, it's guaranteed. So when it's when it's privately issued, what is the fallback? Is there any guarantees? Well, who did they? Or in fact, for some of the people here, 
unlike the Philippine currency, you're following it, it's indexed against the economy, etc. In a privately issued currency, how do they know what this paperclip is worth? Or how, how, how should they discern what the value is? The consensus. The consensus of those people who want to hold it, basically. Until that consensus holds, that there, there is value. When the consensus no longer holds, then there is no value. Which could lead to a crash also. Kasi nga, you know, it's really sentiment driven, but there's no underlying, uh, I guess, support or economy behind it. That's yeah. the challenge. To be fair, uh, fiat currency is the same thing. There's no underlying value on your peso, except for the full faith and credit of the Republic of the Philippines. That's the guarantor of that liability. It's not indexed to the gold reserves of the BSP. It's not indexed to a basket of commodities. It is reliant on the full faith and credit of the Republic. To the extent that you believe in the full faith and credit of the Republic, then it's valuable. And if it's not, then it collapses. Like, uh, for example, uh, the so-called Mickey Mouse money uh, after uh, during uh, Japanese occupation, and there are many other historical uh, examples. Um, we begin, the world began in exchanging things with barter, a product for a product, a product for a service. You can identify the product. Then we invented money. Money became the medium of exchange for an actual product, underlying value. Then we came to the third level, wherein we have derivatives. That, again, has an underlying value, maybe two, three, four, five times over, which created the crash in the US. Okay. Now, number four, we ended up money being the product itself, meaning money is no longer used as a method of exchange for an actual product underlying, but money became a product by itself, bought and sold. But it had an underlying value, which is, as the governor said, the country that issues the currency. Plus perception, plus the game of money traders who will buy and sell currency and therefore move the value of currency like the George Soros of the world, unless they temper their buying and selling. Now we are entering into number five, which is digital currency, which I do not understand until today. And Ed Francisco is correct. There is no underlying value, really. I think the value here is the belief that the next guy who buys the, the Bitcoin is a greater fool than yourself. Comment. Greater fool's theory, Governor. Is that, is that how you see, virtual, uh, 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 I guess, private currency? Uh, the BSP is not as, not as dismissive as, uh, as that. And, you know, I, we look at, it's a fact of life. I mean, there are enough people who believe in it. There are certain transactions that it is quite useful, and we recognize it. That's why we actually issued regulations. Uh, it's very clear that the BSP did not or does not prohibit cryptocurrencies. But we chose to regulate rather than prohibit. And we, so far as we are concerned, we see uses for it for some people who believe in it for remittance or payments. Others would like to use it as an investment vehicle, but I see uh, Commission Amatong, uh, I wouldn't go into SEC territory. Now, whether it is a good thing to put savings into uh, cryptocurrency and hope for it to grow, whether that is a wise thing to do, that's an entirely different story. The BSP doesn't endorse that, and I was quite clear in, in my uh, presentation of that. I think a big part, uh, part of the concern is this too big to fail uh, experience. No? Um, the crypto market is now trillions uh, in US dollars in terms of market size. And um, it has been very volatile. Uh, I think a good example is uh, was Bitcoin. It went down in value in some one minute for 62 about 66%, then it went up again. Uh, I know that this is a big issue among world regulators, uh, whether to prohibit, to regulate, and if to regulate, to what extent. I was just wondering, Governor, if there are 
discussions, for example, in the region about uh, among the central banks um, on how to go about this because this is something new and innovative. But uh, the fear is uh, it might be the market might be too big to fail because if it fails, it means also as it will have a very g a negative impact on the uh, local economy and even the regional or global economy. So is there, are there initiatives um, on a regional level or even on a global level on how to go about addressing uh, what policies should be adopted, uh, Governor? About it. But I think the fact is uh, the scale of cryptocurrency in the overall scheme of things is still small. It is high profile, but it is still small. And you ask about jurisdictions. In Asia, for example, Philippines is uh, allowing it under regulated conditions. Indonesia is against it. Others are still thinking about it. So there, there's, a, there's a range of uh, views. Others are openly allowing it, like Japan, for example. Uh, it depends. But as I said, there's a more serious investigation going on right now by central banks, of central banks themselves issuing their own digital currency, which I said is a different thing altogether because it does have uh, the powerful advantages of a digital currency in terms of uh, ease of using it for business, but it also has the backing of an authority behind it. So, but uh, that's why I don't want to put it in the same discussion as privately issued cryptocurrency because it's a different, fundamentally different thing uh, from that. But it is actually being actively experimented on by some major central banks. The possibility of them issuing digital currency. I'm talking about countries like Great Britain, China, and uh, in, 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 in the European zone. So it's legitimate uh, research that's going on there. Governor, I'm Joseph Busto from UBJFA. I'm a shareful learner. Um, and you mentioned earlier that there were some risks to the financial system. Um, I would just like to clarify if the risk is due to the fact that um, cryptocurrencies is coming to more widespread acceptance but within the US, there are Bitcoin futures and some such. Is the question the risk of whether or not it will lead into another crash similar to in 08 or to the dot-com bubble, or if it, because the, by the nature of cryptocurrency, which is peer-to-peer, -peer, it eliminates or rather overhauls the financial system as we know it. Thank you. As I said also in my speech, I don't think it is going to supplant uh, fiat currency anytime soon. But just speaking for the Philippines and for the reasons that I stated, uh, trust still has to be developed in this uh, medium of exchange. So I think there's a fundamental roadblock. Today, we regulate for two primary concerns. Primarily to minimize its use as a medium for uh, settling illegal transactions, like uh, cybercrime. Sometimes you hear of, uh, of, uh, of um, ransomware, where the ransom is paid using, <coughs> using cryptocurrency. Uh, we're also concerned about uh, consumer protection issues of people uh, being sucked in without understanding and then losing their money, either to hacking or uh, misplaced uh, belief that their money will grow a thousandfold um, in a short period of time. Although that's not, an, that's not a new story. A lot of people already got suckered, not in cryptocurrency, but with more traditional stuff. Think boodle boodle and other kinds of uh, scams. So it's just a possibility that yet this may be another scam. Depends on the users. As I said, cryptocurrency currency is neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It's really on the users. It's the users who define what is going to be bad or good. Yeah, good afternoon, Governor. Yeah, you mentioned that. Um, Yes, P has issued already Circular 944, and which requires uh, business engaged in cryptocurrency to register as a remittance and transfer company. Okay, uh, do you think? Don't you think that because they are required to register as a remittance and transfer company and governed by the BSP rules up to, I mean, to a certain extent, 
Don't you think that might create the impression that, you know, these are uh, allowed as a legal tender? And how, how do you classify them? Is it, do you treat them as financial digital commodity because you are requiring them to register as a remittance and transfer company? So find what cryptocurrency is in the Philippines for this purpose. And uh, as I said, so they're defined. So what, we, what have we done? Uh, you can use cryptocurrency if you're a, legit, if a registered uh, company for remittance. Uh, so there are many business models that uh, are legitimate that use underlying cryptocurrency. There's also, uh, when we use the term exchange, we actually not use it in the stock exchange sense. We use it in the money changer sense. It's like having US dollars. They go to a point of uh, uh, an exchange where you can exchange uh, one US dollars uh, for uh, 51 something pesos. So, so just substitute Bitcoin for US dollars. So that's the mindset. And uh, whether or not BSP prohibits it, People are using it. It's a fact of life. And uh, they see it as uh, valuable. And uh, we also saw the numbers growing fast, although from a small base. So it was a policy decision of the BSP, whether to regulate it and potentially lend legitimacy to what something is, what is potentially not legitimate, or to ignore it and let it grow uh, in an unregulated manner. So our policy call is to recognize it as a reality and uh, regulate it strategically to the point of uh, exchange. So that's where we are. That's not always the decision. As I said, in some countries, they don't want to anything to do with it. So that kind of company is also covered by the uh, AML, AMLA. Yes. So being a registered entity by the BSP, they become a covered person. That is actually part of the uh, start of the approach of the BSP. Thank you. Hello, Governor. I just wanted to. Uh, Another topic. Uh, I wanted to ask about the national ID system. When when that is fully implemented, Governor, because one of our advocacies of Sharefield also is financial inclusion. Uh, right now, it's hard to open a bank, even a bank account. I think it's only 30% or 40% of the Filipinos have bank accounts. And the problem we usually encounter when they come to our bank is they don't have two IDs. We require two IDs. If the national ID system is implemented and they're able to get that, that one ID is enough for them to open accounts and open a, you know, a, an account with the PSE or a PDEX and everything. Is that how we envision it? Uh, yes, that's the idea. So the idea is, uh, should that become law, is for every uh, Filipino citizen and resident aliens in the country to register with an, with an authority, possibly the Philippine Statistics Authority, to basically uh, get a uh, randomly generated number that is his permanent uh, number. Uh, which is uh, basically uh, validated to biometric uh, in imprint. All 10 fingers, two iris, and the face. And that is basically the purpose of that. To link a person, a real person, to a set of unique biometric imprints and a number. And that is your gateway to public services, to the financial system, and to private transactions, including banks. So that's the spirit of that uh, law. And actually is inspired to a very significant extent by what India did in the Aadhaar uh, identity system. So it's, a, it's going to be, in my view, a game changer for the financial system. It will facilitate uh, remote transactions. And this is also where we're coming from. Cryptocurrency exists because there is a problem in real life of uh, accessing financial services in an affordable, convenient manner. Cryptocurrency 
came about because it wants to solve a problem. But what I'm saying is, cryptocurrency is not the only solution to a legitimate problem. So we put forward the proposition of a national retail payment system which will facilitate account-to-account -account transfers. It, now with the entry of a national ID system, it will become increasingly a reality. The only missing piece in the Philippines are reliable high-speed networks. But I think that is also coming about soon enough with the entry of uh, third players. So, the, so when all of this come together, high-speed networks, cheaper data plans or, or free data plans, even cheaper phones or giveaway uh, smartphones, a digital interoperable payment system, and, an, and a biometric ID, then you have critical mass. Then you don't necessarily have to rely on cryptocurrency or other exotic solutions to get at basic financial services. Well, um, I actually uh, studied cryptocurrency about three years ago, and I personally, uh, I, I don't want to call it invested, but I did put in, and it's up by 1,700%. And um, But I'm not yet selling because I'm really studying carefully. My question is, um, the 944 Banco Central is more on regulation for corporations trading in bitcoins like coins.ph but what about self-regulation because like um in the case of uh, like airbnb or in the case of selling like paintings for argument's sake if i'm going to sell a painting um someone could just remit to me through my bitcoin wallet substantial amount without going through the amla um, so my question is would this be coming out with self-regulation other than the ones that is within the 944, which is more for the corporations um, selling big or trading bitcoins. It encompasses a wide range of covered persons. So an example, uh, the art dealer actually is a covered person. And in the case of Circular 944, the covered person there is the exchange. The exchange is where uh, cryptocurrency gets converted into uh, fiat currency and vice versa. Uh, because once it's out there, it's very hard to regulate. Uh, that's actually one of the challenges in regulate, trying to regulate cryptocurrency. It's hard to regulate. So we chose the, the connection with the real economy uh, as a natural choke point. So that's actually the approach that we have taken. Well, you mentioned earlier that the VSP is working to create a digital ecosystem. So I was just wondering, what exactly can we, what specific things can we expect from this digital ecosystem, and how can private companies participate in the creation of such? Actually, under that uh, project, working with the industry, banks and non-banks, so this is not just a bank-only solution. Uh, we have already put forward PesoNet, which allows uh, fund transfers account to account whether that's an account of an individual or the account of a corporation, using PesoNet, you'll be able to uh, move value account to account. For example, a company wants to pay your salary. So from the company's bank account, the company can send your salary to your designated account, whether that is at a bank or at a uh, electronic money issuer like any of their a couple of those already. Uh, there's Paymaya, there's Mint, etc. So account to account. Now, as a consumer, you want to pay for something, you can buy from a merchant by transferring electronically value from your bank account to the merchant's account. And there, there are uh, other similar uh, use cases for this. In other words, you don't need to handle paper currency. You don't need to handle check. All you have to do is issue trusted uh, instruct, uh, digital instruction to move money from your account to the other. So that's actually the, the environment that we are creating right now. And it's happening uh, with uh, PesoNet and uh, coming soon Instapay. And there are other uh, uh, payment streams that we are uh, uh, working with the industry to bring about. And it will become more solid, as I mentioned, with the two other elements, the ID piece and the infrastructure piece. So it can only grow over time. Hi, uh, I'm Topher Clavicidia, a graduate student at UNP. 
I would just like to inquire um, if the government would be willing to account for cryptocurrencies as part of M3 or broad money if it fulfills the four basic functions of money as store of value, medium of, medium of exchange, unit of account, and standard of deferred payments. Or if not part of M3, will the government be uh, amenable to keep it as part it's of utility it? to some. That's why we created a regulatory environment for those who want to use it nonetheless. It's an inclusive financial system.